Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. We'll have time for discussion, or if you have questions as we go along, uh, please just speak up. And today, it'll be topics on ESTF, uh, particularly on the survey that came out uh, recently, and uh, the results, and also any addition upgrades that are going on at this time. So, uh, Chuck, I'll just turn it over to you. It's all yours. Okay, excellent, John. Um, we are going to move kind of fast because we do have a lot of slides and a lot of information to get across in our hour and a half, and I do want to make sure there's enough time for uh, comments and questions and, and just a, a general discussion at, after the uh, presentation. So uh, yeah. essentially that's where we are, is it's the ESTF topics that uh, resulted from the, the survey and uh, um, things that we wanted, that the team wants to share with the rest of the, the forecasters and, and the field um, from, from the surveys and, and how we are doing with the uh, ESTF currently. We have 32 out of 36 offices actively participating, and at the core, the ESTF requires updated grids every three hours, um, hourly grids through the remainder of the current period and the upcoming period. That's generally 13 to 24 hours. Um, three hourly resolution or better for that second period. Uh, also, we also require the following tools and procedures to be used, the data load and blend, the diurnal, which is also known as the NWS diurnal. Um, after we uh, participated in this and had, had most of the region participate in it, we did collect a survey and sent out a survey and, and collected uh, results from that. We did have 126 forecasters, interns, WCM SUs, and MICs participate. We also um, basically got uh, surveys back from 35 out of 36 central region offices, so even some that weren't participating, actively participating in the ESTF responded as well. And we did get uh, 17 office-wide survey responses back as well. Okay, we, we see these survey results as a guide to the team's uh, future efforts. And uh, the complete results are available in a separate presentation that many of you were already sent. It's also available on the ESTF Google site page. Um, basically, it highlights the state of the ESTF and uh, continuing challenges and concerns, and also provides that uh, path forward. Yeah, uh, here's a breakdown of how the, the responses came in. So pretty good uh, mixture from all, all offices, and, and we were actually pretty pleased with it, particularly since some of the uh, issues that went on during that time frame, particularly the, uh, the government shutdown and, and uh, just some... Uh, problems associated with that, and everybody had other things on their mind, I'm sure. Okay, we'll jump into uh, question one, the first question from the survey. And we basically start off with, are you more comfortable with the process uh, now than initially? And it's not too surprising to us that we had a pretty good response with this, uh, as 68% uh, 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 felt more response, more uh, comfortable, and uh, only 11% felt less uh, comfortable with it. A lot of our just open comments, we, the, the questions we asked had a lot of room for, for comments and uh, uh, any, any additional uh, information that people want to provide. And there were several themes that kept coming up, and so we just kind of uh, lumped those together as open comments. And this really is a guide for places where we need to work with on a team to try to make things work better um, for ESTF. So uh, from those, uh, in general, the, the, the highest percentage was uh, better web dissemination for the ESTF grids. Um, people notice an uneven effort apparent, uh, in their, their minds across central region, um, a general lack of customer feedback. Um, there were concerns related to the hourly pops and hourly weather, um, general workload concerns, and then uh, winter weather concerns also uh, came up fairly often. Okay, uh, on to question 2A, as we asked... Uh, and let, let me say, on those uh, concerns, we will go over each of those uh, later on in this, this uh, webinar. Okay, um, now these I wanted to go through fairly quick because they're, they're kind of visual. Everybody gets an idea of what, um, what we saw in the, the results of the, the survey. So question two, Ray, the quality of the information and effort put into the STF updates. And uh, in general, these were, were pretty good. Um, it looks like people were satisfied with the quality and effort that they put into those grids. Um, there was a couple of uh, comments suggesting that effort and quality aren't necessarily equivalent. Um, that is certainly true, um, but that is our goal, is to try to get those to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty much uh, equal. Uh, you may be able to see the, the quality of the information you're putting in there from the effort that you're putting in. So that's a goal of the team is certainly to, to make, uh, the, help the forecasters uh, put the quality they want into those grids in a, an efficient uh, manner. Okay, um, for question two, we asked to rate the amount of mesoscale detail timing information you put into the ESTF grids. And uh, here, uh, the, the rating was, was still fairly high, but not quite as high as the, the effort question. And um, 
but it does look like uh, people are uh, forecasters are feeling that they are getting a good amount of uh, mesoscale detail and timing information into those grids. Okay, moving on to uh, question 2C, we also asked you rate how well you balance workload operational responsibility during hazardous events while performing the ESTF. And this one, um, uh, it, it, the bell curve has shifted uh, to the right a little more here, um, but still I, I'd, I'd rate it as pretty good. Um, and uh, it does show a little room for improvement, though, with uh, I'm dealing with the ESTF and, and hazardous events. Not too surprising in the sense it's kind of a new duty that we're, we're asking the offices to perform during uh, hazardous weather. So we anticipate taking some time to uh, get adjusted to as part of that, the routine for their hazardous services. Uh, on to question 2D is we asked people to rate their understanding of impact-based uh, ESTF, the IESTF concept during hazardous weathers. And that uh, turned out to be pretty high as far as the, the for most people, uh, their understanding of it. We do have a, a fair amount of people down at the, the low end of it, though, at the right side of the, the table, where we probably could stand to have a review. And so to facilitate that, we do have our next slide here, where we'll just quickly go over the IESTF hazardous weather operations, um, our, our methodology for this, and, and the concept from the team of how to, to implement this, and uh, hopefully be more effective at doing doing ESTF during hazardous type weather or critical weather events. So essentially, we've come up with a general uh, priority system for grid element updates. Um, obviously, issue and proactively cancel watches and other hazards and headline information will still be top of the list. The next one, hourly pop and weather, we, we see in most situations that's going to be pretty important to the, our users. Essentially, hey, we want to get Chuck? that. Yeah. Sorry about it. Is a question about this? Uh, yes. In winter weather, at least, I'm not necessarily sure that that order is right. I mean, if you have mixed precipitation, hourly temperatures are, are huge. And, Correct. And if, you, and if you have blizzard, winds are, are equally important before you do uh, <laughs> pop and weather. Oh, by all means, especially if you're following the POWT, you kind of have to have those, those uh, the temperature and, and, and the pop grids in place before you can get uh, down through the... Uh, through the process to have effective uh, weather grids, hourly weather grids. So yeah, I, I definitely agree, and I agree there's certainly other situations where the, this, uh, um, this, this general list doesn't hold. Um, it, it's really, that's, that's where the lead forecasters and the, the, uh, the team on, on duty decides what, where their best bang for their buck is as far as the time spent in the ESTF grids. But the, the key is we want to get information that our users are going to find critical out to them as quick as possible. We, we, this is kind of a response to some of the earlier uh, stuff we were seeing um, in, the, the, uh, in some of the test beds even where ESTF sometimes got tabled during severe weather just because severe weather is so important that we're so focused on it. Um, and, and at the same time, that's kind of the time when the ESTF is the most visible and that's where we're going to have the most users looking for that information. So we're trying to come up with a balance where you can really hone in on the information that the customers and our users are looking for and have that provided in a more timely manner rather than feeling compelled to do a full ESTF update, which will naturally take more time to get that information to our users. Okay, I'm going to continue on down there um, in the list of uh, QPF snow mount ice accumulation. And the caveat stands that uh, all of this stuff is subject to be uh, uh, adjusted and reprioritized depending on the weather situation. Uh, min and ma max T and min T temperatures if there's uh, significant discrepancies. And then the hourly T, TD, RH, wind, wind gust, and uh, apparent temperature. Now, I did put a note at the bottom here that priorities will definitely change depending on weather situation, ongoing office workload, staffing, and user needs. Um, the IESTF provides, a relative, provides more relative information for crucial variables than previous updates. So for instance, wind and gusts might be higher during certain severe weather events, and likewise for fire weather may dictate that relative humidity and, and dew points are being a higher priority. So it, it certainly is very de uh, situational dependent. I guess we'll go on to question three. And the, the question was, uh, during ongoing hazards or changing weather, how often do you update grids above and beyond the normal three-hour requirements? And this, this uh, response was surprisingly good, actually. Um, it looks like most people... Uh, um, responded that they are often or sometimes going beyond that or update more frequently than the three-hour requirements, which is definitely uh, terrific, especially since we are uh, um, part of the, the ESTF concept was also uh, um, doing more of a 
um, updates based on uh, conditions, some uh, conditionally based updates rather than just strictly sticking to a clock and uh, updating as, as conditions warrant it. So we're actually pretty good seeing, seeing that already, even in this, this young state of, our, uh, of the ESTF project. So uh, moving on to question four, during ongoing hazards or changing weather, how often do you issue forecast uh, update AFDs? And, and this was a little less, uh, less uh, of a priority, it appears, than just doing the, the simple updates. And um, we've got a, a higher rank of people doing it sometimes, but more often, um, more uh, rates of people reporting infrequently or rarely uh, doing uh, additional AFDs, explaining those updates that they are doing more frequently. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. This is Ted. Yeah, uh, Ted. Just one quick comment along the AFD part there. Um, yeah. I know putting out a forecast update AFD adds a little bit more work, um, but ESTF is just not about grid work. It's about the total package of short-term information that we put out there. And as we all know, the AFD is really visible and really used by a lot of folks. So when you're thinking of ESTF, please uh, take that into account and, and make sure that you know updated AFDs, even if it's just a paragraph, a couple lines, whatever, um, make sure that that's a high priority because that's the most visible product that we put out there. So that's something that uh, everyone should be uh, considering to put out uh, information through that. Yeah, and I think that we tried, tried to make that easier for people, too, with the, uh, the AFD formatter to try to just encourage it to have a little simple paragraph for updates and, and uh, hopefully uh, make it uh, just an easier thing for the forecasters to do to get that information out there, too. Uh, Chuck, uh, I have one other comment. Uh, this is yeah. Jess in Goodland. Um, yeah. Something you know, kind of to parallel with updating AFD is also we kind of tend to forget social media. Because uh, a lot of people are connected to that, and you know, a lot of people, I would think, especially just the public in general, they're more in tune to what's happening on Facebook and Twitter than going to find our AFDs. So I would think, you know, we should also pay attention to updating the like Facebook posts when weather is changing and when we're updating the grids as well. Yeah, that, that's an excellent, excellent point. And yeah, that, that's uh, certainly uh, quite visible as well, and 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 it, it's it's another evolving part of the, the services that we offer, and it, it's really in a high state of flux. And just in, in our office, we're, we're seeing places where sometimes you update the Facebook uh, uh, comment, it gets uh, wider distribution than maybe a tweet or, or vice versa. And, it, 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 and I guess the, the uh, models that are, are being run to determine how visible certain things are are constantly changing as well. So it, it, it's, it's something to keep in mind, though, because uh, yeah, any way you can get that information out to the more people, the, the better. So that was definitely a good point. Okay, on to uh, question five. John's got up there. Um, describe a weather situation or pattern where ESTF worked well and enhanced the forecast, and did enhancement contribute to better uh, DSS? Uh, specifically on that question, the uh, um, uh, positive uh, reports of uh, ESTF uh, impact on the forecast was uh, uh, pretty high, up at 82%. Uh, just a small fraction uh, mentioned a negative response, uh, impact, and then a, uh, no impact. And, uh, was uh, reported by a few. Okay, and this is where we get into the more uh, some one of the bigger challenges that, that we've been seeing in the surveys, and we kind of anticipate this because definitely the change of what one of the biggest changes we asked the forecasters to do as ESTF was to um, come up with and, and to develop and to work in the hourly time frame when it comes to pops and weather. Um, first off, we want to reiterate. Um, well, let's look at the answer to the question A. We we asked them how many hours from the current time. Um, do we typically forecast hourly uh, pops and weather? And we got a, a response of uh, uh, generally the, between uh, 12, uh, 12 hours or less was, was the, the highest one, which is, fits pretty much with uh, the, the bare requirements of what we were asking is, is for that first period and part of the current period. Um, and then the, the second highest one was ones that went out for uh, up to 23 hours there. And that, that was a, a pretty good response, too. So in general, we're pleased with this because it does show that people are, are following the, the guidelines, at least self-reporting that they are following the guidelines. Uh, naturally, we'd like to see a little further out with time as people get more comfortable with POPs uh, and hourly uh, uh, weather as well. And when um, just as they get more experience with that, and of course, when the, uh, the conditions allow for that as well, the, the forecastability of, of the situation that, that we're dealing with. So based on um, some of the 
the feedback we got, and the, especially the open comments during the discussions of the hourly pops and weather, this is still one of the, the bigger issues that we're facing with uh, ESTF. Um, so we wanted to reiterate that precision doesn't always mean accuracy. So we, we, we really remind the forecasters not to over-forecast the situation and always be mindful of predictability. We, we really want to be uh, keenly aware of the predictability of, of weather event at hands. And sometimes um, you can actually get specific, specific. And if you've got like a real fine line uh, uh, along a front or a boundary coming through, you can um, be fairly specific about that and time it out really nice. And certainly there are plenty of other times where you can't. You just have to generally uh, more ramp up or ramp down pops and, and to get convey uh, the best uh, trends to the user. And essentially, we, we, if you get a, a phone call from somebody asking for a forecast, we, we are, are used to handing out that information. Like, okay, the best time is between 3 and 5 or something like that. If we can get that information to the grids as possible, that, that, that's certainly a, a more benefit to our users. It shouldn't just be for the people that call in and, and talk to us personally. We should be able to try to convey that to the, the users of our grids and our other forecast products. And so uh, one way to do that would be basically with, with uncertainty um, in the future, you tend to see more smoother uh, pop and sky patterns in the future grids and tend to, to stay away from the, uh, the, the, the edges of uh, uh, either, either totally clear or totally uh, uh, cloud covered, um, provided what, whatever uh, confidence the, uh, the forecast is able to, to lend to you based on the model guidance and how conditions are evolving. Now we do admit it does take some extra time, but all we can say to that really is this is what we, we are meant to offer our customers. And it's kind of the main point of the ESTF. This is the information that they're looking for, and we really should be spending a, 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 an adequate chunk of time getting this as, as well as we can, having the best forecast we can for the, uh, for the next several hours or, or if an upcoming event um, in the, the near term is, is going to be pretty high impactful. We want to spend our time there getting that information into the grids. And um, there, it, it's a little easier to automate some of those other grids or at least let the models do more of the work for some of those grids, like temperature and dew point and winds and stuff like that, if, uh, if the models are handling well and you're pretty comfortable with the models. But it's really hard to do that still with the, the way the, the models are, are, are coming up with their own uh, pops in the sky. It, it, we're just not at the point where you can just plug in from a model um, those kind of elements. So it does take a little extra time, a little extra forecaster uh, intervention to, to make sure that we've got the best forecast in those grids. And so we, we do understand that. And just we, we know it's a, a work in progress, and people will get more comfortable. They'll come up with shortcuts, hopefully, to, to make themselves more efficient to get that information in there, but still be able to provide really high quality uh, uh, pop weather uh, and, and sky information into the, those grids for, the, for our users. Now, one of the comments that kept coming up, too, was that the hourly pops that we are trying to provide are not true pops. And the team certainly realizes that. Um, all we can say about that, though, is that they are similar to how NDFD runs the pops. Basically, that, that's when NDFD comes up with your 12-hour pops, um, it is using the, the highest amount it sees during those 12 hours. And it, it, it folds in with how they're essentially forecasting it. Uh, Eastern Region is doing it the same way. It's kind of just the accepted practice. So if anybody wants to get that change, it's going to take really a, a, something happening at a level much higher than, than our team. And I will note that they are labeled, and if you look in the hourly weather graphic on our web page, they are labeled precipita precipitation potential to kind of avoid the, uh, the true pop uh, sense of what, what a true pop is. So uh, here's a specific example I wanted to show everybody. Um, imagine you have the current radar image up in the uh, left-hand corner of the page. And uh, how are you going to convey that over the next hour? How is that going to move? How is that going to look? Now, if you look at some of the model data, the model might suggest something like the middle. Or you might be tempted to draw something very specific and try to, to basically just capture what's there now and just translate it over to the east or whatever direction it's moving. And that certainly is a very specific forecast, very precise. But it also is a very high potential for being wrong in, in, in any particular location. So obviously, we want to avoid that. And, kind of find a sweet spot there between uh, the amount of effort we put in and providing better information for the people in the, uh, the near future, with, with, uh, particularly when you've got situations where you've got something already on radar and you're trying to deal with how it's going to evolve.
So the, the, I would think the preferred example would be the one, something similar to the one of the uh, uh, up in the right-hand side of the screen there, where it's a more smooth down, kind of gets the idea that uh, this one particular area has a little higher percent chance of, of precipitation and a lower percent chance uh, uh, further away from where the, the core of it appears to be going. Okay, another uh, topic that really uh, came up as a, a trouble area for people working with ESTF, and some, some that even the, t the p folks on the team are, have always had problems with, is just the idea of discrete convection and how we uh, handle it. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty there, there's a lot of uncertainty at when it's going to develop, where it's going to develop, and really all we're asking you guys to do is just kind of put out, if you can, put out a little better forecast than the one you received and just provide a little more information. If you think that this one area has a better chance at this particular time, then go ahead and try to uh, put that into the forecast. But again, don't get too carried away and, and don't be too uh, specific and just kind of get the general idea across to the, to the, the forecasters or to the, uh, to the users of our, our forecast. Essentially, follow the ramp up, ramp down idea, hit the trends and timings, and uh, remember, just do your best you can given the science and predictability. We would like to be as specific as the situation allows, but um, in, in doing that, def we don't suggest blanking the entire CWA with uh, some pop, especially if you can dif differentiate the values in different areas and provide a better service. And uh, accept the limitation of the models and forecast in general, and be mindful of the predictability of the situation. Try to provide better information than the previous forecast, and sometimes just a slight improvement is possible. And we, we understand that. We're, we're not looking for perfection, and we just want everybody kind of working the same direction and making things slightly better and slightly more information, better information to our, our users. And again, just don't let this be burdensome. The updates should not take too much time, and, and just do not uh, over forecast the situation. And I go back to that same example. Think of what time information you would tell a paving company calling you or a friend on the phone and just try to get that information, some of that information across in the grids. Naturally, this is another very um, very high on the list of uh, complaints or, or problems that, that we would like to address and, and like to find magic bullets to help uh, solve them with. But it, it, it's, again, just the nature of forecasting that's always going to be a challenge. And it used to be able to get away with it when you're forecasting 12 hours out. You can just say, well, yeah, things will change, but this is the general idea. When you're forecasting at the one hour level, though, it, you kind of have to be more specific. And, and it, it forces the, the, the forecaster to really be in, intimate with those grids and, and make sure that it's conveying what they think is going to be happening at, at that time. Um, and this is where that it gets, becomes a challenge because mixed precip situations, it can change hourly. And you definitely need to consider top-down weather tools that will help you with that. Um, PWT, POWT is one of the ways you can do that. With It's, it's got a, a suite of uh, top-down elements that you can put into the, the, the setup and use, and it helps you uh, automatically uh, come up with a, a decent uh, weather grid based on uh, what information you put in those other, other grids. Um, another way you get around with this combining weather is an option, but uh, anybody who's used combining weather options knows it runs quite slow, um, when, uh, in particular when you're putting it in, and you have to, it, it, it tends to be a little, more, uh, a little less specific about what you're forecasting than if you allow uh, for a generous blend area uh, of combined weather. Uh, you can also use that area as a mass, though, to speed some of this up. So you, you could um, choose to do it maybe just over your forecast area uh, or maybe just where you've got pops. And, and it could actually run a little faster because I definitely notice that whenever I run a combined, use combining in a, uh, a weather tool, it runs a lot faster over an edit area than it does over the entire grid. Okay, but um, that, that, the thing about hourly weather is we still need to convey those changes in the weather grids as our temperature changes hourly and our pop grids change hourly, we have to be cognizant of what that does to our weather grids and update them in the same way. And because of that, it gets very hard to change the messy weather grid um, for any, even for a small change. Unfortunately, this is very important to the public, though. That's the information that they're looking at most is when these things are going to change from one precip type to another. And if we have some confidence that we can we can forecast one way or another, then we really should try to do that. And again, uh, POWT does make this easier in these very complex situations by not manipulating the weather grid so much as manipulating the elements 
that go into making that weather grid. And we'll have another slide or two on the POWT later on, showing that. And again, this is just the type of situation when ESTF is most valuable to our customers. And it allows us to provide digital DSS for that. And um, this is an example, too, where the H&Ts or other forecasters not necessarily working on that ESTF period can look in the grids and actually pull out a forecast and help people who call on the phone. And it, it might ease some of the burden on the ESTF forecaster to try to answer every single question um, that are coming to the office for the ones that don't uh, aren't comfortable yet using our uh, our gridded forecast on, on on the web or elsewhere. Okay. Um, another issue that came up, and we heard this, uh, particularly of course from the offices that have a lot of terrain and also dealing with lake effect. And um, this, I, I consider as one of, the, if not, this is the, almost the greatest unique challenge for ESTF because the the a lot of the skills necessary, a lot of the effort necessary to, to do proper ESTF with terrain and lake effect don't really apply to a lot of the other um, offices that, that don't have the, these, uh, these extra challenges. And I, we are definitely sympathetic to those offices that are, are dealing with this. Um, and the terrain, I just to elaborate, ter terrain impacts pop and sky, um, but its effects are generally held stationary. So even as the weather goes moves through, the way the terrain affects the, the, those elements are uh, are very specific to that location too. So that, that adds an extra challenge. You just can't simply translate things across as you you would maybe on the, on a plains uh, WFO. And similarly, lake effect snow can be uh, quite vexing. The snow bands have subtle movements, and they can cause a major difference in impact over small areas. And sometimes this is even below our, our grid spacing. So how those particular offices do that. Um, it, it, it requires extra effort, certainly. And we are certainly uh, interested as a team in how they, they uh, have met these challenges in any way we can incorporate some of those either tools or techniques or, or any tips they, they have into some of our tools that we provide um, would, be, would be quite useful. And uh, definitely we were in the survey it was noted that the forecasters do need more control over the tools and better ones to deal specifically with these, these challenges. Um, edit areas seem to help out too. If you have uh, edit areas where, for, I think more so in lake effect probably, where you have lake uh, areas that tend to get hit on a certain wind direction, then that's important to have lake, of, uh, lake effect uh, edit areas that you can turn on and, and use tools within. Um, again, it, it, it requires a lot of effort. We do acknowledge that, and unfortunately there's no magic bullet. Um, this probably affects terrain folks more than lake effect, but there is a new version of ESTF Extrapolate that I, I've worked on that does have some built-in terrain sliders and adjustment factors that might be of benefit to uh, people trying to move uh, pops or, or sky cover through an uh, uh, area that has terrain. Um, it incorporates a lot of the Tim Barker tools, um, the, basically the up mountain, uh, down valley type things that, that um, and it has a, a, a weighting factor that you can, sl a slider bar that you can control how, uh, um, how much of an influence that has. Um, I, I've been, I kind of put the tool together here at this office where you don't have all that much terrain, but I, I tried to come up with uh, situations where it would magnify that and, 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 and played around with it. It, it. it seemed, as far as, it does kind of what I was looking for it to do, but really the, the terrain office is going to have to tell let me know if it has any value or not. And um, I can get anybody who's interested a copy of the tool, and they can test it out as well and, and maybe give me some feedback about it. But I think it might help out a little bit. And that, unfortunately, that's about all we can offer the, uh, the, the terrain offices right now is, is, is not having a, a magic solution here, or being able to go directly with a model, um, model population here. If you still want the control as a forecaster, how things evolve throughout those hours in the, the ESTF, then it, it's a tool like this, I think, that, that might help out just a little bit. OK, also remind, don't forget the grid seller. That can be useful for places that typically are, are behave one way or another. And you can uh, plug in that information in those situations. OK, now I want to talk about uh, grid monitoring and, and how you can infuse that into your database. 
And it's really, the OBS database is kind of the key to a lot of what ESTF does. Um, it basically is the beginning point of our forecast. And so you need to know what's in your OBS database, and you need to have a good, um, a good uh, OBS grid QC uh, 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 process where you're, you're, you're using that and, and keeping your database a, as fresh and as, uh, as uh, it looks like we got lost here. Um, yeah, keeping the, the database as fresh as and updated and also free of any bullseyes, any, any erroneous data as possible. So and knowing what's in your, your OBS database is very important. And it's also important to have, because it, it, it basically determines your verification, how you're verifying. Also is important for creating the bias corrected grids that we use. Um, you can use in the, the short term, but also in extended. Um, the, the GFE monitor, or the, the grid checker is being shown here. That's what the, uh, the, the, the picture is of the grid checker. It also has its own built-in weather element group. I believe it, it's created automatically, but if not, you can create it yourself. There are existing elements that it creates, um, and that they're, they're pretty good to look at if you wanted to actually dig in and see which elements are, are maybe causing your, the grid checker to flag you for things. You can look at the specific elements. But that information is kind of available for, uh, well, it's available for temperature, dew point, and sky cover. But in particular, you can look into temperature and dew point and see your, the, the difference between what your forecast said it should be for this hour and what is actually in the OBS database. And that information is actually pretty important, too, because that, that kind of shows you that's your error right there. And there are ways to use that error information to create a, uh, basically to influence future grids in a way that, that comes up with a, a, a better forecast while retaining a lot of what your, your original forecast is. And so in that method, you can use the, the real-time difference grids that that provides, or you can make your own on the fly. And uh, this is kind of a concept for forecasters who want a little more control over um, how the, their forecast is affected by their current, uh, their current error, essentially, in the, the, their current forecast versus the OBS. And you can have some use that to adjust um, your upcoming forecast based on that error to tend to, uh, essentially what happens is if you've got a forecast error that's repeated in your, your, your grids, it's going to continue along at a certain percentage of that error rate in your future in most situations. So if you, once you have an error grid like this, you can actually apply it and, and do the reverse to add it back to your, your forecast to, to gradually adjust your forecast based on that error. It's a, it's a, it's a kinder way of maybe nudging your forecast back to, um, back to what the current situation is. And I've got a couple examples that, of what you can do with that uh, available on our, our, the Google uh, ESTF Google Sites page, that, that presentation that will show you that. OK, um, the GFE monitoring program is also a really good one that uh, we'll keep track with. And, and this one updates. The, the previous one, the grid checker, updates every five minutes. So that's, that's almost instantaneous as you update your grids. The GFE monitor updates only once an hour. And at, our, at my office, it updates uh, at 17 after the hour. Now, uh, it does keep track uh, of how your forecast is doing compared to the OBS database at, at, at very specific points. And there is a way to rerun it, though, if you, want to, uh, if you just did an update and you want to make sure that it's keeping track with your forecast well. You can rerun it by going to the uh, formatter launcher and running the hourly data uh, file in there. And you don't even have to save it or send it or anything. You just, as soon as it's run, it will be picked up by the GFE monitor and adjust that. One other thing I'd like to mention about the GFE monitor is I, I would like to, and, and hopefully we'll find a way to look into this, of, of applying a, a, a forward-looking mechanism where it could uh, look at LAMP data or, or something down the line and compare how your, your forecast is going to be a couple hours compared to what the, 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 the LAMP data or the, the other model guidance is suggesting. And almost give you a heads up where your forecast might be going off track. Similar to what the uh, AVN FPS will do with uh, looking ahead at your, 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 your TAF information. Collaboration communication is another topic that came up pretty, uh, pretty frequently in, in the survey. And, um, this is a, a kind of a more of a challenge for the ESTF 
folks because a lot of what you're doing with ESTF is responding to what the current OB situation is, what you're seeing out there, and not so much with what things could be. And because of that, there's a little, little less room for just a discussion about it, a little less, uh, 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 less uh, communication kind of necessary to say, I'm just trying to match my forecast to what's going on out there. Now, it is certainly important to let your neighbors know if you see something that, that is going to impact their, their boundaries and, and the, the border as you make a, a change to your forecast. And if you're seeing something out ahead, that, that might also be worth them uh, noticing as well. And uh, obviously, you can talk about that with, uh, with them in 1-2-Planet. Um, another option, I think, in, in one to plan is rather than just uh, directing a, a, a note to, to a specific uh, a WFO on your neighboring WFO, maybe just put the comment in without directing it to them so they don't feel compelled to respond and then get taken out of track, but they see that, hey, yeah, you're updating it. You're, you're, our neighbor is updating for those new pops popping up or because they think the pops are going to be a little higher this afternoon, that kind of thing, and, and maybe not... Uh, necessarily dominating a, a uh, that that moment where you have to kind of respond to something one to planet. Really, what we want to do is see a little more communication going on between uh, uh, folks as they do this, um, but we also don't want it to be burdensome um, as well. But just kind of work a little more efficiently. Um, a good reminder is that a quick phone call also to your neighbors is pretty effective. If you see something, you just want to give them a quick call and 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 chat with them about it, that, that can be a really, really effective way of uh, communicating that. And again, uh, using a forecast uh, update, uh, AFD is, is pretty good for conveying that information as well. Um, and certainly, uh, another big thing that came up during the, the survey was just the, the amount of workload that is involved with the ESTF. And, and we kind of uh, sold it that way. That, that's kind of to be expected. We're asking basically one person to, to focus on this. And, expect that's going to take a, the bulk of their shift is really staying up with what's going on with the current conditions and look, looking ahead for the first couple periods there. Um, so it is a high forecast priority for that zero to six hour forecast. Uh, although if the, for, if the hazard event's a little further out in time, that's probably the time where they want to focus on their efforts as well. And basically we are the weather authority and we want to stay that way. And the credibility insists that we get it to the first things right and we uh, properly initialize and have the right track for that forecast. Um, we do have tools and techniques that help to mitigate and can automate some of this. Uh, for, uh, the data load and blend is, is one of those, and it does. It, the nice thing about that is the forecaster is still in control. It, the forecast determines how far or if it blends at all into the, the current forecast. The extrapolate with blending options are also pretty handy for forecasters that want to have a little more control over how quickly um, current conditions transition into the, the forecast. And the use of other, uh, other personnel when, when they're available, the operation team is, is kind of key to keeping the, uh, the workload from becoming too, too great in certain um, high impact weather situations. But we do have to remember as we're doing this extra work, we have to remember that it, it is quite beneficial to our customers. Um, we see FTF as a learned process of behavior that improves with experience for both the forecasters and the users. And a great responsibility kind of uh, that, that's, that's in the hands of our forecast to provide that better information more frequently and enhance our user uh, decision support. We do feel a greater focus will lead to a higher situational awareness for both the forecasters and our users. Um, with, with most emphasis being placed wherever the high impact weather is during that short term part of that forecast. And customers look to us as the weather experts to convey that, those impacts and those trends. And we want them to look at our grids as well as uh, other ways that they look at us for those, that, that information. And what we are doing here is still quite ahead of the curve. Technology is still catching up to us, essentially. Um, the models are quickly improving and providing their own version of the hourly re resolution type of data. And other entities are out there using that and, and providing their own attempts at hourly forecasting as well. Um, the dissemination means are, are coming in a little more slowly, though. But we do see that now that we've kind of built it, that there will be people that will use that information and, and uh, um, take advantage of that to, to provide that in, in a, 
better, better methods for the users. And that includes ourselves trying to come up with better ways to display that on the web and, and get that information out there in other ways as well. OK, uh, question seven. We, we did ask uh, during busy, ongoing, or expected weather, uh, how do you typically incorporate uh, the operational team in the ESTF process as necessary, and how does this help? And our duties alter for busy weather. And we asked specifically how our duties impact during the busy weather. And uh, 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 well, the, the first uh, graph on the, the upper right hand one is basically 72% uh, said that yes, that they do incorporate uh, the operational team, and they uh, they do alter things during uh, uh, busy weather situations. Whereas uh, uh, about a, a fifth of them, fifth of responses said they do not do that. And typically, what duties are re uh, reassigned is uh, aviation and marine is pretty high. Uh, radar and se severe weather is probably the highest in our, our response. Um, weather story, DSS, and then uh, winter type highlights and media, media calls and stuff like that are, are lower on the list of duties re that are, are reassigned. And uh, we did look into uh, how duties are. are adjust as well during business, uh, busy weather. And um, in, in typical situations, the shifts were adjusted. That was the highest report was that, that they are, the, the shifts were adjusted to cover various lengths of uh, the STF or, or um, less of the, the, the further portions of the ESTF to cover that. And, and uh, some other frequent comments were a, a single um, responsibility for that single forecast responsible for the ESTF period. And then a significant number of people reported just having sliding responsibility. And, um, and then other ones responding just that the duties are kind of weather dependent, so it, it will adjust that as necessary. There was a disturbing number that did say that they dropped the ESTF if they're in busy weather. And kind of that, that sentiment is why we uh, came up with the IESTF to hopefully um, maintain ESTF um, Respond, uh, uh, presence essentially during these high impact uh, events. I do want to specifically talk about the concept of dropping the aviation duties, though. Um, it, it, we, uh, as a team, we kind of think that that's probably one of the things that should be avoided if possible, just because the, the time frame and a lot of the, the weather information overlaps for aviation with, uh, with what the ESTF is responsible for, particularly that focus on the first 6 to 12 hours. And uh, we would like to see that kind of as, as the last resort if possible, and uh, hopefully come up with ways where that still is retained by the ESTF forecaster. But we certainly understand where there are situations where you, you necessarily have to split that, that up. So we would... Hopefully that's not the, the, the knee-jerk reaction, though, is just to drop aviation from the ESTF forecaster. One thing we know is that the, a lot of offices are, are taking radar and severe uh, functions away from the ESTF forecaster, and that, that definitely is something we, we approve of. We, um, it just our sentiment that um, when there's active stuff on the radar and warnings and, and that kind of responsibility is needed, that then the ESTF forecaster needs to be somebody else. You cannot do ESTF and uh, try to issue warnings and, and keep up with the radar. That's, that's asking way too much. OK, uh, next question was about verification, is what, what uh, we have uh, coming down the pike. And I mean, most places are already installed as uh, the, the Boise Verify Short, which we've uh, shortened to Boise Short. Um, and essentially, it's uh, just Boise Verify for the short term. And it's, it was added recently, or, or should be in the process of being added um, across the, the central region with, with one of those earlier tech notes that were sent out. Uh, essentially, it's, it's very similar to what you get in a, likely get in your email already from uh, Boise Verify for the full days and the full 12-hour uh, period type forecasting. Um, but this actually has hourly uh, uh, 12 hours of, of forecast information. Um, is available and tells you what, what did best and what, um, what how, how your forecast did compared to, to those as well. And in general, uh, anybody who's used this will know is that the con short and the, the bias corrected con short are, are pretty hard to beat in uh, the near term forecasting, especially when it comes to uh, temperature and, and dew points. 
Okay, uh, definitely one of the top concerns we heard back from the survey was um, we need a better, a better web presence and the point and click needs to be improved for using our ESTF information. Um, we proposed a fix to how QPF is handled within the, um, GIF, uh, within the point and click. It, it, it seems like it was um, splitting it up evenly and not really focusing on, on the right time frame for, uh, for um, dealing with uh, QPF uh, in certain situations that as you get sub six hour time frame. So that, that's a fix has been proposed to that that should uh, improve that at least on the web. Um, the last web upgrade was, was better for ESTF. It made the hourly weather graph more prominent. Um, and then we, there are sprint teams now that are addressing many of the web issues nationally and, and we as a team will provide input into that and, and any, any, any suggestions that we get from the field um, we'll definitely pass on to them as well and trying to look for ways to uh, improve our, our web presence. Um, the Southern Region Experimental page is, is still active and it, it's, uh, it's kind of part of their, their mobile page and that's um, what we've recommended as a team that people can link to on, the, on their, their front page or top news items as a way of getting that hourly information in a, in a forecast manner and not just like using the uh, Hourly weather graphic, or hourly weather graph, as 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 the main means of seeing our, our forecast information from the ESTF. Also, I, I want to remind that that the activity planner works very effectively for this as well. Um, users can just input any kind of parameter that they're interested, in, and it will scan the forecast and using our latest ESTF information, come up with a time frame when those parameters are met uh, for any of the uh, the users that are looking for that very specific information. Another thing I want to point out is the enhanced digital, the enhanced data display that uh, the office in Charleston is working on right now. Um, it, it, it also uses the ESTF information, and it's kind of an example of the, maybe the cutting edge of where some of our, our web presence is going with uh, with our, our NDFD forecast and, and the web. And this example here is showing the, the traveler's forecast, where you can actually put on a path of where you want to go, and similar to a uh, Google. Um, um, driving directions type thing. It will tell you the forecast specifically at each location and exactly uh, the time that you are forecast to get to those locations based on how long it's going to take you to travel. And this I've always heard was kind of like the holy grail of what we want to do with NDFD is be able to move across the the whole database and have the forecast constantly um, updated and, and, and most accurate where you're going to be in that data, where in that location and at what time based on uh, be able to use that whole database. And it appears that they're pretty close to being able to have that done pretty effectively there with the EDD. Okay, another thing I'd, I'd like to point out is uh, what they're doing down at the Jacksonville office. They've taken their um, their ESTF, their their hourly weather information that that they are doing. They're one of the few offices in Southern Region also doing uh, hourly uh, weather and and hourly pops. And what what they've done is they've actually created their own little page off of here where they have uh, these mouse over graphs where you can actually see the, the weather and conditions change hourly based on their forecast. And that, that, that to me seems like a pretty, pretty neat idea. It would take some effort if we wanted to try to do that in Central Region, but if there's enough uh, interest in that, I, I think it would be worth, uh, worth considering and worth looking into what it would take to be able to do that, because that, that's an, another effective way of uh, presenting our, our ESTF hourly information on to, uh, uh, to our users. Okay, now I want to talk about the POWT in the ESTF. Um, hourly weather grids are a prominent feature of ESTF, naturally, um, but these can be quite cumbersome with changing weather situations. Um, as a derived element, uh, the weather grid, the hourly weather, is required to be updated as other elements change. And we're, we're talking whenever POPs change, definitely have to change the weather grid. Whenever T changes, and in the cold season, you definitely need to change it. And possibly as any thunder parameter type changes, and uh, as um, QPF uh, changes could affect the intensity, you, you might want to consider changing the weather uh, grid as well to capture that. And other things like if you've got a, a warm layer loss or anything that's going to make change the, the, the type of precipitation, you'd want to have uh, that, that reflected in the weather grid as well. And all that is made easier um, in using the POWT. It is these changing situations where the POWT is really of a, of, of a bigger benefit. Um, it keeps your database meteorologically consistent, and it does 
It is less workload in active weather than if you tried to do all this by hand, keeping track of rapidly changing uh, parameters like that. So we did ask a question about the POWT. Um, we asked, asked, asked the users to share their thoughts about it, the forecasters to share their thoughts. And um, the highest one was, the, 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 the highest response was that they just haven't had it uh, installed yet, so they aren't very familiar with it yet. Um, the people that did respond uh, specifically about it, knew about it, uh, it looks like about a quarter of them liked it. There was a percent that did not like it, though, a uh, significant percent, and also uh, some, a group in between. Um, I liked it. So, but there's some definite examples where it it, it, it really uh, makes a, a much better uh, forecast and much easier forecast um, in these situations. For example, if you've got a strong uh, force and resulting more QPF and a higher uh, snow to uh, water ratio, you want to update your QPF and snow ratio grids, and then the weather type. Uh, is already available in what you've done with the POT grids, and then you rerun that procedure, and it will help derive snow amount, ice accumulation, weather, and it creates those grids just by changing two other grids that you change, and it will produce that for you, and, and you have good confidence that that was a, a, a consistent, and uh, you still have the integrity of that, that forecast. Another example is you have warmer temperature results and less freezing rain than expected. Uh, you update the hourly T and max T to capture this. You'd rerun the precipitation, the procedure, the POWT, to update the P type. And then you rerun uh, another part of the POWT and will derive your snow amount, ice accumulation, and weather, and you're done. So essentially, you, you, because you didn't have to change POPs at all, you're still happy with POPs, but the temperature change, you rerun uh, one, one thing, and you're able to derive those other grids out of that that uh, saves time doing it that way. And this is very helpful for high impact events and uh, that are due to, due to its quick update uh, capability. And this really makes it uh, perfect for ESTF in, in winter weather situations. There is a steep learning curve, though. So once people get past that, we, we hear very good things out of, out of the, the users that are comfortable with it and use it, and particularly in situations where they see this more frequently, uh, the changing uh, winter weather situations. OK, I also wanted to discuss uh, con short. Uh, summary and ideas. And uh, the con short does create realistic hourly grids. The detailed features are subject to the usual model error and can be off by a county or so and by a few hours. So it's granted that the same caveat you have with most uh, forecast uh, uh, model data. Um, the observed hourly precip fields like LAPS, RTMA, MPE, and RFC QPE can be used, could use some additional work. But these are, these are critical for spinning up the pop QPF and snow grid. So a lot of the input that goes into it comes in a little rough. So it's easy to understand how, how the end product isn't as, 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 as perfect as you'd like to see, but that, that's the benefit of having those multiple inputs is that, that you get ideas from each of those models getting into the, to the, the essential ensemble that is the con short. There's a lot of detail in time and space for QPF, pop, and snow, and weather. And that is hard for some to embrace. And we see, did see some comments about people weren't quite happy with, having, with the, what the con short was producing. Um, we do see a lag and a delay between the HRR running and then being available in GFE as of roughly four to five hours. And then there's some spin up issues re resulting from this for precip pre and QPF. The eviction feature uses a 850, 700, and 500 millibar winds, and that can cause poor results in certain situations. An example of that would be lake effect snow showers and then orographic uh, terrain type features. And non diurnal events, especially in the first three hours, frontal passages can be an e extra challenge from the con short. Um, a review of the con short composition is that it does use the five background fields, OBS match via uh, Tim Barker's GFE CERT program, and the composition is. Uh, uh, one part LAPS, one part the RAP13, um, one part HRRR, the one part RTMA, and another part of the NAM12. Each the CONS product is run every hour and procedures and produces hourly data out to 24 hours for the following elements. <laughs> Temperature, dew point, RH, winds, wind gusts, sky, pop, QPF, snow mount, ice accumulation, and weather. And three to six hour and 12 hour weather uh, hourly elements are computed for pop, QPF, and snow mount. A fair number of our offices have switched to AOPS2, so they are using uh, some of the AOPS2 uh, 
ESTF tools that we have provided and procedures, and we're in the process of, translate, of transitioning some of these over to AWIPS2 as well. Uh, the required tools have been transitioned, data load and blend in the, the NWS diurnal. Uh, other tools and procedures that have been transitioned is the extrapolate sky tools pops from radar. Uh, one note on the extrapolate, though, uh, there is a, a baseline difference between how AWIPS2 handles the, I think it's the Cartesian uh, grid that, that AWIPS operates on, um, versus AWIPS1. And because of that, it does uh, mess up some of the base code for the extrapolate tool. So that we're going to work on getting that adjusted and, 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 and fixed uh, over the next couple months. Um, other applications that were transitioned was the Boise Short and the Grid Checker program. We do need to tr uh, properly transition the GFE Monitor and the Grid Seller program, though. Hey, in addition, Chuck, yeah. Uh, the GFE monitor is is transitioned. Oh, excellent! Well, that, that's great. Cause that, that's a. I, I still think that's a pretty important uh, uh, application for keeping up on the. So yeah, that that latest version is transitioned to OOPS two. That that's perfect. Okay, uh, AFD and ZFP formatters and the overrides that we provided have also been transitioned to OOPS two. With some of the tools and procedures, uh, we do have some updates forthcoming. The extrapolate uh, has a version out that fixes some minor bugs. Ags that terrain option also allows for adjustment of the model derived sp uh, speed, and then for A A2 we will have a movement fix uh, put in there uh, shortly. Um, the diurnal we're looking at in, in, in the inclusion of a con short diurnal option. See what what it takes to put that in there, and perhaps also adding a lap or HRR version uh, uh, as an option for using the diurnal as well. Additional possible future upgrades will include uh, looking, re-examining the data load and blend, seeing where we can improve that. Um, a new pop from a radar or model, uh, maybe possibly getting radar directly into GFE and, and use that as a starting point as well. A um, couple other things we noticed in the survey. Uh, uh, it looks like uh, Minnesota uh, St. Paul office had talked about an ESTF touch and go, and they also have a check, check and go tool. That sounded pretty intriguing, so we're probably looking to that and see if, if that's something we want to support and, and, and share with the rest of the offices. And then uh, Green Bay has an ESTF update timer, so rather than just having a yellow banner that pops up and surprises you, you'll actually have an, a countdown clock that will be able to keep track of how soon uh, those ESTF grids are, are expected to be updated. Uh, during the survey, we asked what kind of tools are, are used frequently besides uh, the data load and blend, the required uh, ones, and the diurnal tool. And uh, the most common one was the extrapolate, but the model blend and satellite tools were also uh, mentioned highly. We did have a significant number of people talking about uh, using the tools very rarely as well. Uh, also, that pop from radar and the STF touch and go seems to have uh, spread beyond the, the, the offices uh, uh, of uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. Um, in tool question three, we described we asked to describe what are situations where the tools did not handle it well, and these are basically ideas of where places where we need to work on and see if there's anything we can do to come up with tools or, or uh, procedures that would help out in these situations. Um, not surprisingly, discrete popcorn thunderstorms was one of the big areas. Mixed precipitation was one, and just a general comment on the poor model solutions and uh, situations where the weather is rapidly changing. Drizzle, non-diurnal temperatures, uh, clouds in, within terrain, uh, places where you have tight temperature dew point gradients, uh, areas where fronts pass through and uh, changing cloud cover, dissipating fog, and thunderstorms and gust fronts were also mentioned there. We also asked uh, what are the tools in general helpful. And in, in general, that was the highest response was that they were helpful, although there was a significant um, response that said that they were rarely used. And then um, also a significant number that were just not comfortable using the tools and the preference for some of the house tools uh, rather than the ones we provided. So we did also ask whether tools or needs would enhance the ESTF process your office, if any. Um, but by far the, the greatest response was a better pop from radar tool, uh, better sky tools, a um, little bit better uh, a better model uh, information, uh, model data coming into the grids, uh, mixed and changing weather issues. So essentially, it mirrors what we saw with the uh, the, the problems um, that that things just aren't handled well. Um, this leads us to our continuing ESTF efforts. Um, we are looking to convert all the 
all of uh, we're working on converting all the other parts of this to e AWIPS 2 and continue to support both AWIPS 1 and 2 and as, as they work with ESTF. Uh, modification and improvements to the tools uh, as we see areas of opportunity or ideas that, that come to us or uh, come uh, through us basically. Um, additional of high, addition of higher resolution models and ensembles and along that line uh, I believe the HRR is in, they're talking about putting that actually on the SBN and will provide us with a, a more more levels and more information out of that model as well. And we'll try to incorporate that into the, some of the ESTF tools and procedures when that's available as well. Um, we're also going to work on trying to enhance the web pre presence nationally. Um, work with other regions to push their version or, or our version of the ESTF to go more nationally. Maintaining our ESTF Google Sites page, which the link is right there. Um, look into hourly QPF options later as maybe an extra uh, grid element that could be used for, for various uh, other um, uses on, on, on the web or, or however we want to disseminate that. And also looking into the possibility of, of aviation grids derived from some of the ESTF uh, elements that we're doing. And finally, I want to remind everybody this, that this is your ESTF, and that the ESTF team is open to field suggestions and welcomes all ideas, comments, and criticisms. We are a field-derived team. We answer to the field, and we should reflect the field's aims and goals when it comes to this. And we want you to help us to make this successful for all of us and the agency in, in general. And we want to continue to develop and enhance um, your own ESTF personal best practices and efforts. And if you do come up with some best practices and efforts, please share those with us um, so we can help uh, disseminate that to the rest of the, the, the forecasters across the, the region. And we do, in that sense, we strive to be a clearinghouse for that kind of information for all the forecasters. And uh, we do recognize that many offices have unique forecast challenges, and the local forecasters there are the experts at meeting those challenges. And that those are the people we want to work with to come up with ideas of how to uh, improve um, what we're providing to, to help them basically forecast better at the ESTF level. And we need to hear back from you about what works and how we can improve things that, that, that need more work. And just a reminder, we do not have all the answers and therefore rely on the field to help us continue to develop and support this effort. Well, thank you, Chuck. And uh, we'll open uh, the floor up to questions or uh, comments. So go ahead. Hey, Chuck, uh, it's Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for doing the presentation. Uh, thanks for summarizing all these results, too. Um, I was thinking uh, back when we were the concern about the terrain issues for like using extrapolate and stuff. Yeah. I've been kicking around the idea for something for sky cover for us. Uh, I wonder if maybe I could get some people that are interested in maybe breaking it, kind of almost taking like the uh, PWT methodology type way where you have a you have one grid that's just the pops affected by terrain, and then another one by, say, advection or whatever, and then you merge them together at the end. Right. Um, I was wondering if that might be a way to kind of help with some of these issues. Um, originally, I was going to do something with like low, mid, high clouds that the forecasters would edit, and then merge them all together to one sky cover. And I started to think maybe that would be helpful for pops as well. Uh, is anyone out there doing something like that now, or would think that might be helpful to kind of address that that situation? Um, sounds like there's not a whole lot of response on that. It was something I wanted to throw out there to see if anyone's been thinking along yeah, those lines. It, it sounds might, quite interesting, Jeremy. Yeah, I'll, I'll play around with some stuff here at Goodwood to see if it's actually feasible or not. We don't really have the terrain issues that others have, so yeah. I don't know if I could be a good voucher for that. But um, well, If you come up with a methodology, I could see that applying down the road, maybe way down the road, to, to come up with a decent way of developing uh, aviation grids as well if you're dealing with multiple layers and, and merging them together. That's almost kind of definition of what you're looking for when you come up with a ceiling height and stuff like that. Okay. Well, I'll keep kicking that around locally and see if anything can fall out of it. Hey, Chuck. Uh, Jeff yeah, in Jeff. Uh, Milwaukee. We, we got an interesting data call from Aquas uh, talking, curious about how many eastern region and, what, and central region offices are participating in ESTF, and they were wondering what our plan is to get the other four offices on board, and if we have one. So it's just they were yeah. curious why the other, <laughs> if the other four, ha if we had a target date for getting them 
so we'd have a hundred percent right uh, participation. Yeah, it, it's. I think it's time to talk to those offices and see where they stand and, and what might be holding them up still. This is John. Um, I can work with Martin and Jim Siva King uh, to go back uh, to the original uh, implementation agreement of the ESTF uh, to see where they're at in satisfying uh, the criteria that was that was uh, developed to join ESTF or not on a local level. It, it much of it had to do with. Um, staffing uh, levels at that time uh, that were either uh, deficient um, or, or that uh, were not going to be filled in a timely manner. And there was also uh, early AWIPS 2 issues uh, that were being um, uh, a roadblock. Uh, so I think we, we have uh, the ability to, to, to get uh, to 100 percent here. Just not sure of the timelines, and I'll work with Martin and Jim. OK, thanks. Uh, just as an example, we're an AWIPS 2 site, and we're down three staff members, but we've decided to continue. Uh, Chuck, this is Dan Baumgart in La Crosse. Hey, Dan. Hey there. First, I wanted to thank uh, you for giving the presentation, but also the other people on the ESTF team for the work that you are all putting into this effort. Um, one of the frustrations I have is our web presence item and really the nebulous um, information that at least I'm receiving in my office, and I'm guessing there's others out there, about the direction uh, of our web services and how we're going to get this data uh, finally put to, to the web. And I, you know, I, I guess I'm in this hole for communication in this area. It's always a nebulous answer that, yeah, it's being worked on. So I guess I'm, I'm asking you um, if you could share any more information or any other regional people, because it's, it's a level away from me. I don't see what this work is, the sprint teams. There's no details on what's being worked on, what the target, what the target is, when the target release date is. So if there are other central region people on this call that maybe could provide a little bit of flesh to the skeleton. Um, could you do that for us? Uh, well, this is Kim. I guess um, I don't know if I can give you anything satisfying. Um, the um, the evolution of, of web presence and uh, and really the whole world of, of mobile applications is um, it's a little bit slower than we would like it to be. It's a lot slower than we would like it to be. There is a defined process that you mentioned uh, within NIDS. Um, Central region and eastern region are are on the NIDS system, and so we anything we do on the web has to go through uh, their process. And um, some of the other um, uh, other than there are a couple of things like that EDD is is actually being developed. Um, it's actually, because it's on preview, it's on preview because it's an experimental, it's an approved experimental process that has a little bit faster development time. Um, but whether it will be accepted as a permanent, uh, you know, fully supported system will, will be determined by getting through the processes of you know, performance and IT security and various loops that are um, that are demanded by the NIDS process. Um, the Southern Region Innovation page is not in NIDS, but they will have to. My understanding is all regions will be going to the going into NIDS ultimately. So, I uh, we we really have to find a way to be more. Uh, nimble and flexible in developing these kinds of things, and um, uh, but right now it just isn't. I and and I, I I don't completely I don't pretend to understand whether you know it might be that there's just so much to do and so few people assigned to do it. Um, there I'm sure that there are requirements with respect to processing efficiency and security and those kinds of things that I don't fully understand and appreciate. But the bottom line is that it's taking longer and longer to implement 
changes to the web and to develop um, to develop any kind of a, a application that that will reach. To, to tell you the truth, many of our partners they don't they don't even care about the web per se. You know, like as in desktop, they want to know they want to be able to access information wherever they are, whenever they need it. Meaning on a tablet or a smartphone. And so, um, w what we really need to do is be developing more applications that that are designed for mobile. Um, the the one the one project I know about that is um, making some headway in that direction is uh, the emerging tech team, and particularly Corey Pieper and some people down in the southern region who have developed this bootstrap, bootstrap um, based program that will convert uh, web pages into mobile friendly uh, depictions. Um, you know, that's moving forward. Uh, but Right now, in order to in order to get something, the bottom line is that w right now, in order to get something changes to the web, we're going to have to go through the process of entering uh, requests and designs and requirements through the NID system. Uh, probably get assigned to develop them on their dev site, and then go through the process of staging and and moving to production through this sprint process, which is somewhat of an ironic name because I think it only happens about every six months. That's that's what I know about it. Yeah. Well I got lunch coming up so that'll be more satisfying, I guess, Kim. You're right. It's it's hard. It's you know, we got people in the field here doing hard work and trying to get these grids and not just the grids but, but other services going as well, you know, during these short term events and yeah, it's just been really a snail's pace since NIDS has gotten hold of it. It seems like they're almighty and it's a one direction thing and coming at us and, and our bottom up process really isn't is really stifled. So it's frustrating. I just would like more communication on some of the hard things that are going on that we know of that are that are and what the timeline of release is on that. But all right, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, I um you know, I'll try to follow up and see if I can find out some information on what what processes are you know what improvements and um, and pages and so forth are being are in the are in the hopper for development. I mean, maybe there is some work that I don't know of that um, that could help with that. But I, I understand you want if you're going to put in this work, then then you want to make sure that. Um, Partners who need it to make decisions have access to, you know, usable and um, and easy to interpret displays of that information. And so uh, it is important. I, you know, I just um, I don't know how to make it any. I don't know how to make it available any faster. But it's I I, I do appreciate the frustration. Hey, this is Ted in Louisville. I just have. Uh, Kind of an example, um, not, and, and this is dealing with wind chill and apparent temperature, an hourly apparent temperature that I guess is on the hourly weather planner, which certainly isn't the best thing uh, ever, but it's something that at least it's out there, and hourly information is out there. Uh, we had a customer called in, actually the travel supervisor for Jefferson County uh, School District here in Louisville, Kentucky, wanting to know. They called me. They called six times yesterday, and the last time I answered, and he wanted to know. We had a wind chill advisory. Out, he wanted to know hour by hour wind chill readings um, for late last night and this morning, so he could take that information and recommend a decision to the school superintendent on whether to close or delay schools for thousands of kids. So. I actually read him, read him straight from our ESTF grid, hour by hour apparent temperature wind chill readings, starting like 5 a.m. through about noon or so. Um, so he didn't know that that was on hourly weather graph, but it is. But that was just a case where the effort being put in is important. And I did know that that information was current in our best uh, estimate. And in that case, that information actually did provide uh, DSS to him because he took that information and then recommended a, a decision to a super, superintendent. So in that case, uh, it actually worked pretty well. But I agree, a better presence is definitely needed. Yeah, Ted, I think it also points out that you're having to deal with a phone call and 
tell him the grid numbers that are in your grids. You know, he well, that, that, that is true, he and, but I, I think, I, mean, we, I guess what the deal is, we, we can always, we always want more than what we have in, in a lot of things, but I suppose we also have to just take what we have and, and, and use it the best way we can, so I think it's also up to, uh, not it's the best way, but it's also up to a local uh, office to uh, paint or to expose or to advertise what we do have, even if it isn't the, isn't the best by any means. Uh, to those who, who might need it, either through the, uh, the top news, through social media, through outreach, through, through some method. At least something is there. It, it's got a long ways to go, but we got to use at least what we have now. Uh, that's all we can do. Okay. Well, I would like to thank everyone in the last minute or two we have left here for attending today and for your patience getting through an hour and a half. If you have any questions, um, uh, Chuck's available, so is uh, John Gagan, and of course, uh, Kim Runk or myself here at Central Region Headquarters. Thank you again, and uh, wish you 